You know what I've learned? The biggest changes in the world are never on the front page of the newspaper. If you want to understand where the world is heading, look into the ideas that are floating around. Look at beliefs and convictions. If you watch carefully, you see that people slowly change their opinions as to what is right and wrong for themselves and for society. Whenever there's a big crisis, suddenly these changes happen very fast. This is one of these moments when some of the ideas and convictions we used to have are changing super fast. These changes will influence your life more than the coming US elections or the next iPhone. It's about to change the most important institution of the world. The company. This is what extreme cost cutting looks like. I wished you didn't have to see this. I sure wish I hadn't. I sure wish it even hadn't come to this. A clothing factory in Bangladesh where they produce exactly the stuff you wear, your t-shirts, your sweaters. Nearly 1,200 people died because European clothing companies wanted to cut costs to the max. We can talk about it all day, but if you see what happens when the cost cutting goes too far, it's different. It was for me. It changed my ideas about what an entrepreneur really is. And you as an entrepreneur, you have the responsibility to change something. You have the power to change something. You can't pretend anymore. Um, yeah, and there were enough drops uh, like throughout the last centuries. Um, yeah, so that was maybe the last drop that was needed for me or for us to say like, no, let's change that. Right now, things are not looking good for a lot of companies. Loads of them are going bankrupt and even more are barely hanging on, surviving on government support only. And it's not just the small companies. Hertz has gone bankrupt, the largest car rental company in the world. One company after another, from the chain of Italian restaurants Vapiano to the kitchen maker Poggenpol, is filing for bankruptcy. And lots of really large and extremely successful companies like Booking.com are surviving only because the government is giving them millions in taxpayer money. Companies that have made billions over the last couple of years cannot survive a couple of months in which people only bought the things they really needed. What does it say about our economy? Think about that. I think about that a lot. We both do. We are entrepreneurs ourselves. Just like him. And him. Welcome. And her. And him. We started very different companies. But what we have in common is that we all, at some point, came to the conclusion that the current way most large companies work I pump all of what I can pump to the question to Maximizing profits for their shareholders as their main goal, that this model no longer works. There is a need for more inclusive capitalism. We are not communists, don't worry. Not even socialists. We believe that companies are a great way to achieve something. We are not monks, we are not people who say we don't want anything. Dus ze mag ook best geld verdiend worden. Yeah. Maar het moet niet het enige doel zijn. We are not against making deals and making money. We just happen to think we found ways to take the positives of the company and leave the bad part behind. So we can focus on producing sustainable products and services and build a better society at the same time. Sounds good? Einhorn office, part of it at least. Well, we, we make products for... Below the waist. Below the belly button. Want to see them? Yeah. Condoms. We bang them open so you can start banging. 
and uh, tampons. They say Nazis out, tampons in, and menstrual cups. And they also do big, really big condoms. They are called big. Can you show them around? Yeah. Yes. Normally, for, for maximizing profits, we would expand to the US and um, do alternatives to the brand and make more designs. But instead, we do like big sustainability projects. And because we see that, you know, what's, what's the maximum lever that you have on stopping the climate crisis and the, and the social crisis that we are having and facing that is getting worse and worse. And it's not selling more condoms, I must really say. But if we were driven by shareholder value, that would be what we would be maximizing. That's the, I mean, that's the fucking riddle that we're in, that we have to stop this, but the system is forbidding us. And that's why we decided to run our company in a different way. Happiness is not a KPI or like a good family life or what's your impact on the environment or how do people working with you feel or what's your personal development. That's, I mean, that's not in your bank account. There are people who say, your goal as a company is to make as much as possible between what you give and what you earn. That's the biggest thing to make. But I see it quite differently. I think that you as a company have to make as much value for the people who come to you without you taking your own needs out of the picture. Uh, maar vooral moet op zoek moet gaan naar ja, hoe, hoe, uh, hoe ben ik van waarde voor, uh, voor de mensen die hier komen en voor uh, de mensen om me heen. Biertje, iemand? Vanaf de dag dat de gemeenteraad had besloten dat we een horecavergunning kregen, kwamen er mensen over de vloer die daar kansen zagen. Maar tegelijkertijd zag ik dus daarmee ook wel de behoefte voor een ander soort strandtent. Ik vond dat er te weinig kwalitatief hoogwaardige koffie was. En ik vond dat er te weinig biologisch en gezond eten was op het strand. Nee, nee, nee. Nee. Deze twee moeten ze allebei weg. Ik wilde niet per se meer werken, dus ik ging ook op zoek naar iemand die dat met mij kon gaan doen. Want ik was een surfleraar en niet een, een horecabaas. Dus uh, ja, daar wilde ik wel iemand anders bij hebben. Nou. En dan komt hier nog het terras. En, en ik was toch een beetje soort van eigenwijs puur concept aan het neerzetten. Ik dacht, stel je voor dat dit nou niet lukt of niet in het eerste jaar lukt. Is het niet zo dat die nieuwe eigenaar dan gaat beslissen, die voor de helft beslissing bevoegd is, van joh, Hans, die biologische appelsapjes, dat gaan we toch niet doen. We gaan gewoon volgend jaar een pakje Vicky verkopen, want daar is de marge vier keer zo hoog voor. Uh, en dan kunnen we veel sneller die investering terugkrijgen. Dat was iets waar ik heel bang voor was, dat als ik de helft van mijn zaken iemand ging geven, dat die dus ook voor de helft inspraak heeft. Ja. En dus gaat, gaat, ja, logisch natuurlijk, weet je, want daar, daar betaal je voor. Uh, maar concessies gaat doen aan de puurheid van het concept om maar uh, dat investeringsbedrag te kunnen verdienen zo snel mogelijk. You see, this is how it often goes. You start a company with great intention, you want to make the world a better place, provide for yourself and your family, or at least not make the world a worse place than it already is. But then, along the way, money starts to be more important than what the business was about. We've seen it a thousand times. Remember WhatsApp before they sold to Facebook? The body shop before they sold to L'Oreal? Whenever a company grows big and the opportunity for a takeover or large investment comes up, the values that the company had tend to fade away and the consumer feels betrayed. It happens over and over again because the shareholders want more money. In the old days, the CEO of a company used to know most shareholders by name. They were family or local wealthy people. But when more and more people started to buy on the stock market, shareholders became more distant. Remember how I said that a crisis can speed up change? At the start of the 70s, there was an oil crisis and a large recession followed. And around that time, just one article in an American newspaper made the whole business world turn their head and do things differently. In this article, the American economist Milton Friedman argued that companies should focus on their shareholders, getting them as much returns as possible. Money, money.
As long as it was within the law, Friedman said all decisions within a company should be aimed at getting maximum profits. Suddenly, CEOs were thinking less about what the company was producing and more about ways to lower costs and raise the profits for their shareholders. Friedman's idea spread like the newest rage in an elementary school. It brought us straight into the age of Wall Street, where greed, for lack of a better word, is good. It brought us into the roaring 80s and 90s in which making as much as you could, regardless of the consequence, was the rule. It was the birth of all the fancy finance tricks that are being performed on companies to boost their share price. Like leverage buyouts, splitting companies, outsourcing work to other countries. What could go wrong, right? The age of turbo capitalism was born. Friedman's ideas about the importance of the shareholder in a company's decisions might have changed the business world radically. The rest of the world hardly noticed. Most people just continued to work, watch football, took holidays and raised their children. But for all entrepreneurs, CEOs and business consultants, the world had very much changed. The shareholder became the most important focus in all their decisions. Now, we are in a super recession and companies are falling over left and right. Meanwhile, the world is heating up way too fast and people are on the streets protesting for higher wages, better environmental protection, housing, education and so on. And at the same time, the whole business community is starting to doubt whether this focus on shareholder profits is working out the way Friedman had said it would. Shareholders find profit more important than people. All major business publications, from the Wall Street Journal to the Financial Times, run articles about the deeper issues with this focus on the shareholder. And she wrote a book on where we all went wrong, basically. But we will get to that later. I just wanted to show you this first. Nou ja, ik vond mijn leven prima op dat moment. Ik had gewoon een goed inkomen. Ik ging elke winter op vakantie met mijn gezin naar Hawaii en naar Indonesië en naar Australië. Er is natuurlijk een moment van ja, ga ik nu mijn soort van egoïstische zelf volgen en cashen? Of ja, voel ik me daar niet goed bij en ga ik het op een andere manier doen? Dus uh, wat wij zijn gaan doen is die... Uh, dat eigendom over Hevelin een stichting. Waarbij je dus gedraagt als eigenaar en als ondernemer en ook leeft uit de winst, maar het niet meer verkocht kan worden en, en daarmee dus ook niet meer gespeculeerd kan worden. Uh, en dat bedrijf dus ja, onverkoopbaar is en het dus ook niet meer toe doet hoeveel het waard is voor de nieuwe ondernemer die wil instappen. You see, to me it all comes down to ownership of a company. And why is that? It's something everyone takes for granted. But the system of shareholders who own the stock in a company they never set foot in creates a strange position. Imagine working for somebody you've never even actually seen before. Dus er moet iets anders komen. Iedereen heeft ook wat idee van ja, oké, okay, dit huidige systeem dat gaat niet meer werken. Dat gaat voor ons misschien nog werken, maar voor drie generaties down the line niet meer. Um, dus er moet iets anders. Not everyone thought this whole idea of shareholder calling the shots was unsustainable. You see, these things go wrong gradually, not immediately. That's why you can't really see it in the news. Sure, there were some issues, but the whole focus on the shareholder went quite well throughout the 90s. We didn't really see what happens in the long run if you decide to move production to Asia because it's just cheaper and will bring your shareholders higher profits, or if you ignore any environmental damage because ignoring it will bring the shareholders more dividend. At first, you don't really notice. You can do it for a long time before things start to fall apart. It's like not servicing your car. You can continue driving for a long time, but at some point, it will start falling apart. But there's another reason everybody jumped on this idea from Milton Friedman that shareholder value should be the focus of the company. Let's dive 
a little deeper with renowned economist and author Marianna Mazzucato. There are stories, narratives, discourses, which mythologize some actors much more than others. And that gets used to lobby for a greater share of the income. And there's a whole theory that refers to shareholders, for example, as the residual claimants. The idea is that everyone else in the system has something called a guaranteed rate of return. So workers will have their salaries, banks will have their interest rates, and they have this guaranteed return, and shareholders risk getting nothing. So if you do have a lot of wealth created, for example, in a biotech boom, the internet boom, the clean tech boom that we're currently experiencing, the idea is that shareholders in some ways have the right to that booty once everyone else has been paid their share because they were the biggest risk takers, because they risk getting nothing. And that's completely based on this false myth about what everyone's doing in the economy. No one has a guaranteed rate of return. So debunking the, the shareholder value theory means debunking who value creators are and who the risk takers are. And that requires an alternative theory based on collective value creation. Maximizing shareholder value means that all you really care about is, for example, short run reductions in cost or short run increases in profits, they're often related obviously, as opposed to the investment in long term areas, whether it's the capital development of a company, so the machinery, whether it's research and development, innovation that can take 15 to 20 years for a company, whether it's human capital formation, training of the workforce. So all these long run investments in people and machinery and new knowledge suffer. It's like the 9-11 of uh, capitalism. Seeing that all those brands from all the different levels all produced there and um, that the safety was so poorly designed and just taking like the risk to waste these people's lives. Only if you see events like that you really realize, fuck, you can't, you can't hide anymore. You can't pretend that you didn't know. We were like just thinking, we have this kind of entrepreneurial spirit and power and we really want to build things, but do we want to build them like that? So that's like the end cause of it. And then you do, you look at your value chain and you optimize and optimize. And that's what we're learning, you know, doing the better marketing, getting more money, pay, paying people less, outsourcing, going to other countries. That's actually, yeah, that's what you learn in, uh, in business, of course. That's how globalized, globalized turbo capitalism works. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were getting better at that. And then we saw, oh, that's, that's the result of that? I don't want to be a part in that. That's weird. That's, I don't want to build this world or this company who does that. That's weird. Um, maybe, you know, instead of just demanding uh, change and demanding new laws, let's change the operating system of the companies and of our economy itself. And uh, we are just looking for fellow entrepreneurs who had the same kind of vision and then we met Armin Steuernagel, who started the Purpose Foundation. Brilliant guy. He has come up with clever solutions for running a company without the downsides of capital and shareholder pressure. You know, if we want to save the world, we somehow need to force these players that are currently partly destroying the world, partly destroying our planet, we need to, we need to cage them in. Today, we have all the big companies absently owned by big funds, by uh, fund managers that sit in Hong Kong that decide what the CEO in Frankfurt uh, or Paris uh, needs to decide and the CEO decides about uh, whether a manufacturing site is closed or opened in Brazil and nobody feels what actually the consequences of its actions are. So the fund manager doesn't know that his pressure on the CEO leads to people losing their jobs and family being destroyed in Sao Paulo. Because it's absentee ownership, they're not there. There is no difference in the law 
if you own a sack of potato or if you own a company. You can sell it like this, you can destroy it, you can do whatever you want with that. And that somehow felt super strange to me. The, the way how we allocate companies is very simple. There's the one mechanism is exactly this, you know, what we call capitalism. Money equals power, so the more money you put on the table, the more power you get. Why should the people who give the money have the power? The people who should give the money should get a good return, sure. But why should they steer a company when they have never been there? They're not the best people. In Denmark, we have the proof that actually even for shareholders, it's better if they don't have the power. So the shareholders on the stock market, they have no voting shares on the stock market. They cannot uh, vote, they cannot influence the company. And these companies, believe it or not, make up 60% of the entire stock market of Denmark. Companies like Novo Nordisk, um, Carlsberg. This was Carl. It is very important to keep the company really close. Ook al omdat ik de eerste niet deen was die het bedrijf leidde vanaf uh, 1847. Dus um, toen ik benoemd werd, heb ik me later horen vertellen dat men zeer teleurgesteld was dat het geen deen was. Maar ze waren opgelucht dat het geen zweet of een noor was. Dus dat, dat viel toen mee. Wat wist u van Carlsberg? Dat het een biercompany was. Dat het een bier, bierbedrijf was. Het feit dat het een foundation, onderdeel van een foundation, een stichting is, was voor mij wel een hele belangrijke uh, uh, ja, beslissingsfactor in het hele verhaal. Dat er een structuur in zo'n bedrijf is waar je toch een bepaalde zingeving hebt binnen het bedrijf. Dus om nou elke morgen in bed uit te komen om het beter te doen voor de derde Ferrari van een investor, dat is uh, niet zo motiverend. Wij zijn ook een, een regulier beursgenoteerde onderneming, behalve wij hebben een, een dominante aandeelhouder. En die aandeelhouder, mocht er grotere beslissingen zijn waar gestemd voor moet worden door alle aandeelhouders, dat zij altijd uh, de meerderheid hebben. En wie is die ene aandeelhouder? Dat is de uh, Royal Academy of Science. Uh, die hebben van de oprichter van Kalsberg hebben die een stichting in de handen ge gekregen. Uh, die dus de aandelen van, uh, uh, toen was dat 100%, de aandelen van Kalsberg hebben. Want hij vond uh, wetenschap heel belangrijk. Hij heeft er dus een, een stichting van gemaakt. Uh, waarbij de professoren uh, de leiding hadden, zou je kunnen zeggen, de indirecte leiding. Uh, en ook de dividend uh, kregen. En uit het dividend mochten ze dan uh, wetenschap bedrijven. Nou, voor, voor de oprichter was het eigenlijk een bescherming uh, voor Kalsberg. Dus hij wilde dat uh, Kalsberg uh, in uh, Denemarken zou blijven. Uh, en dat is dus door de statuten geregeld, zeg maar. En het tweede is dat hij wilde dat als het dividend kwam, dat dat geïnvesteerd werd in research. Uh, dus uh, ontwikkeling, uh, in kunst en in cultuur. Dit zijn alle medewerkers die 50 jaar bij Kalsberg hebben gewerkt. Uh, en zoals je ziet zijn dat er nog wel uh, wat. En dat gaat uh, door, dus een, uh, een gallery of fame zou je kunnen zeggen. Maar de fame is, dit zijn de mensen die Kalsberg groot hebben gemaakt. Of ze nou brouwer waren of uh, chauffeur of uh, boekhouder. Uh, als je 15 jaar bij de zaak was, dan kreeg je uh, je eigen portret. Is Kalsberg een bedrijf waar mensen over het algemeen lang blijven werken? Heel lang, ja. Uh, uh, vinden wij het heel makkelijk om mensen uh, te vinden. En als je het hebt over Kalsberg, we zijn een globaal bedrijf. Maar Kalsberg Denemarken vindt het heel makkelijk om mensen te vinden. Je merkt dat je ook hier bij onze personeelsleden dat ze het heel belangrijk vinden dat bijvoorbeeld de foundation die heeft 10 miljoen euro gestort voor, voor COVID. Daar zijn ze enorm trots op. Uh, het feit dat er zoveel van het dividend uh, naar iets toe gaat wat relevant is voor de samenleving, uh, dat vinden mensen belangrijk. En hebben ook het gevoel dat ze werken voor iets wat een beetje, een beetje groter is uh, dan uh, zomaar kijken naar de, de beurskoers uh, uh, en andere mensen rijker maken. Er zijn veel vormen van kapitalisme. We call it the varieties of capitalism. So in Scandinavia, companies aren't really maximizing shareholder value. There's something called stakeholder value. Or in Spain, there is a whole region in you know, the Mondragon uh, Basque region where they have cooperatives. In the UK, where we're sitting today, there is a very famous cooperative called John Lewis. It's a retail shop. 
So even in any moment in time, there's also many companies not maximizing their shareholder value. And really, I think what we have is that there hasn't been enough attention even to the actual practice of running companies in different ways. So there hasn't been a proper discussion globally of what works, what doesn't, what are the disadvantages with companies that run their corporate governance simply through maximizing shareholder value. What can we learn from companies that don't do that? All I learned, that was the standard way of doing business. Think of a business idea, find investors, grow the thing until on paper it is worth something. And nowhere is this more visible than the world of digital startups. Becoming profitable is not the goal of an investor. Um, usually investors want to sell a company at a multiple um, of the value it has when they start investing. And becoming profitable, uh, profitable is a long-term um, development. And um, that doesn't make sense for them because they want like, exponential growth. And uh, that's why you're not supposed to become profitable. You're supposed to grow in revenues, to grow in size, to, uh, to go in different markets, maybe acquire competitors, but grow, 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 grow. It sounds extremely familiar. I started a nonprofit computer security consultancy company. So the way that it works is all of the profits, you know, from our company, and when I say profits, this is after everyone pays and everyone has gotten paid, uh, go to support charity. And I'm not just talking, you know, 5% of our profits, 10% of our profits. I am talking all of our profits. We have 40 staff members. We have over 100 customers. We are the first Dutch uh, preferred supplier for, for Google, for government, uh, law enforcement, banks, insurance companies, hosting providers, telcos, software companies. In the last six years, not only have we built a successful business that is colonizing the security market in the Netherlands, but we have won many, many awards and the European Commission uh, called me one of the nine most innovative women in the EU in uh, 2019. Woo! Business schools and everywhere else, you know, teaches us that, again, you know, business has to be this vehicle for commercial shareholders. But again, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. We can re-envision business as being a powerful form of activism. Most startup boot camps, this is what they are going to tell you that you have to do. I mean, as entrepreneurs, we get, of course, the exponential curve kind of shoved down our throat. You need to scale. You need to architect your startup in such a way that it can grow exponentially. You need to come up with business plans that illustrate to investors how you are going to grow exponentially. So we get this Silicon Valley model and everywhere wants to be like Silicon Valley. But why? In terms of uh, gross domestic product, GDP, you know, of a national economy, of course, you've got this curve and it always needs to be up and to the right. Yeah? And what happens if the economy stops growing? You know, layoffs, recession, suffering. But why is this the case? We need to really ask ourselves the question, are those exponential curves getting us where we need to go? The reason why we cannot flatten the economy is because there is too much extraction. And that extraction, once again, you know, IPOs, mergers, acquisitions, stock buybacks, dividends, you know, this is all what's pulling value out of the economy. But the problem is though, you know, this growth, this, you know, puts pressure on our, our environments. This growth puts pressure on our societies. And we know by now that it's no longer sustainable. But because there is so much extraction from the economy, it needs to continue growing just to maintain a steady state. Even in Silicon Valley themselves, they can tell you that this whole model of entrepreneurship is not all that it cracked up to be. If you go to San Francisco or the Bay Area, look around you. There are homeless people all over the place. There is incredibly obscene inequality. You know, there are so many people angry at the tech companies for the way that they have displaced people and destroyed communities. So, uh, 
I think that being a non-commercial entity on the commercial market is a super powerful tool. For example, you know, I, with Radically Open Security, I put a completely nonprofit security company on the security market. And by the sheer presence of the fact that I am on the security market, it means the commercial players have to compete with me. They compete with me for staff. They compete with me for customers, right? <laughs> now, it turns out actually that ethics has market value. It's the same thing with fair trade, right? I mean, people can vote with their dollars or euros for the world that they want to live in. And when you are a social vendor on the market, then it allows not just consumers, but also corporations and governments to vote with their euros. And they've got a lot more euros than consumers do. So basically, they can make the world better by simply purchasing from this party rather than from this party. It's good to see we are not the only ones. There's more and more of us, entrepreneurs who do want to set up a company, but who don't want to fall in the trap of making money for the shareholders no matter what. Once you take on money, in a venture capital case, you get dependent on money. It's, it's like you're, um, you're like a druggie or, um, and you cannot, they don't want you to become profitable. So you get dependent on money, you have to get more funding, more funding, um, and you can't like really set up an organically grown, healthy company anymore. And Facebook, I think, is a, is a good example. Also, so Google and Airbnb. Um, it started out really with an idea improving something. Airbnb, the idea behind Airbnb is great, it's, but uh, what they actually then went through and actually destroyed, um, that has nothing to do, I think, with the original idea, but you were put on a track as a founder and you couldn't because you were, make, you were made dependent on, on uh, investments. Um, you just lost control of that whole uh, vehicle or car. Um, yeah, and then too much money is at stake to lose it, so you start fighting. And it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's just not cool. Wat er soort van in essentie mis is, denk ik, met die grote techbedrijven, is dat ik ben echt wel van overtuigd dat die originele founders hè, met hele mooie ideeën dat bedrijf zijn begonnen. En op een gegeven moment wordt alleen nog maar met de bril winstmaximalisatie gekeken naar, naar dat bedrijf. En dat levert gewoon heel veel ja, eigenlijk, uh, nare trekjes op. Kijk, ik ben ondernemer, dus ik, soort van, wat, wat ik hier kan brengen is, uh, is ondernemerschap en het op een andere manier doen. But now, there are a lot of people starting companies in which they don't have to do bad things just to satisfy their investors. Like asking for government help while your company has made billions over the last years. So, so the trigger om hier over na te denken was uh, dat Booking staatssteun ging aanvragen. Nou, toen werd ik boos. Dan <laughs> dacht ik dit, uh, dit klopt niet. Weet je hoeveel staatssteun ze hebben gekregen eigenlijk? Uh, 65 miljoen. 65 miljoen. Ja. Oh, dat is best veel. <laughs> ja, en ergens, het is heel veel. En aan de andere kant denk ik, ze hadden het dus ook helemaal niet nodig gehad. Want als je een jaar eerder 5 miljard verdient, ja, heb je dan 65 miljoen nodig van ons. Ja. Maar het is gewoon omdat het kan. Het kan, dus we pakken het. Ja. <laughs> Eigenlijk heb ik mijn frustratie in 10 minuten in een LinkedIn-post gezet. Er stond in, Booking is een winstmachine. Hè, dus hoezo gaan zij staatssteun aanvragen? En los van het financiële aspect, ik ben zelf een maker van digitale producten. Ik, ik storm al veel langer aan, dit, uh, aan die manipulatie. Er is nog maar één kamer vrij en boek nu en knipperende knoppen. Als je nu zoekt in uh, sommige stadscentra, dan krijg je resultaten die zeven kilometer verderop zijn. Dat is niet in het belang van jou als consument, maar ik weet wel waarom die, bedrijf, waarom die hotels bovenaan staan. En dat is omdat ze een hogere commissie betalen. Dus uh, bij genoeg likes en mensen die ook klaar mee zijn, ga ik een crowdfunding starten voor een alternatief. Dat was een beetje in de strekking van, van de post. 2,5 miljoen mensen hebben hem gezien. En ik heb 40.000 uh, steunbetuigingen gekregen en nog per e-mail en LinkedIn berichten 
echt, ik denk wel meer dan duizend privéberichten nog. Nou, wie kan ik het woord geven om enige inleidende opmerkingen te maken voor deze sessie? Ik wil wel wat zeggen, ja. Ja, is natuurlijk een mooi moment. Drie maanden geleden een LinkedIn post en nu zitten we hier uh, daadwerkelijk bedrijf op te richten. Dus uh, snel gegaan. Heel snel. Heel snel. Ik denk oprecht dat, het, dat een andere manier van je bedrijf structureren noodzakelijk is om eigenlijk die, die problemen uit die platformeconomie te kunnen tackelen. Wat heel grappig is bij deze bijeenkomst, en dat wil ik wel even op wijzen, is dat in mijn, of ons, notrele vaktijdschrift, en dat is dit, hier, toevallig het laatste nummer, staat helemaal een artikel over zaken doen, niet alleen aan shareholders value, uh, daar niet alleen daarmee rekening houden, maar ook meer aan de maatschappij, meer een breder verband. Dus dat is wel weer grappig hoe dit zo samenkomt. Peter Boeken wordt een uh, digitale ontmoetingsplek waarbij we hotelgasten en hotel-eigenaren bij elkaar brengen. Ik denk dat als een, een digitaal product wordt ontworpen met het belang van de eindgebruikers in plaats van het belang van zoveel mogelijk winst maken, dat er echt een heel ander soort uh, website ontstaat. En dat voel je als consument. Ik natuurlijk vragen over de inhoud. Eigenlijk is het ons te doen om te laten zien dat die platformeconomie op een andere manier georganiseerd moet worden. Dat dit wat ons betreft de oplossing daarvoor is. Als we hier zo even tekenen. Ik, ik ben echt oprecht van overtuigd dat bedrijven heel veel problemen zouden kunnen oplossen in de wereld. En, en dat soms veel slimmer kunnen doen dan, dan overheden of, of stichtingen. Gefeliciteerd. Goed gedaan. Gefeliciteerd. Those companies that have done so well that they have been able to give out big dividend payouts, for example, to their shareholders and have had enough money to do these massive, you know, billion dollar kind of share buyback schemes, I don't think they should have asked for help. Um, I think it was wrong because it's obvious that if they had money to give to those uh, shareholders, of course, they would have money to now, at least for a period, not give out the dividend payouts and use those funds to be more resilient. And I think there was and is an opportunity to do it differently with what I call conditionalities so that the government bailouts, the government support be conditional on companies changing. So for example, uh, in Denmark, they did pass uh, legislation which said that companies that use tax havens and hide their profits in places like the Netherlands, which unfortunately is, <laughs> you know, has a dysfunctional tax policy, um, you know, would not be able to be eligible for the bailouts. Or in France, I think Macron was one of the clearest. He said, we're not here to save companies, we're here to transform them. So he put strong conditions on both Renault, the car manufacturer in Air France, the airline that they had to reduce their carbon emissions, but also produce locally with uh, French manufacturing capacity, both for its industrial strategy, but especially that green mission that was embodied in that conditionality was very ambitious. Eighty seven percent of all assets on the stock markets aren't owned by super rich, aren't owned by states. 87% are owned by pension funds, insurance companies. That means by you and me, by all of us. We are the ones and who, who are sticking to the power. The interesting thing is we give the money to a pension fund, they give it and they say, well, you know, we just need to maximize to give our pensioners a good pension. We give it to the best fund managers. The fund manager says, well, I need to maximize profits because otherwise the pension fund will not give money to me. So we have created a super strange system. I, I ca just cannot uh, understand it. A system that really takes all our pension monies, insurance monies, and invests us in a way that everybody is the slave of the, of the other one. And nobody feels free, nobody can be a steward, nobody can be responsible. Because only if there are people who say, well, this is my company and I don't want to put chemicals into this river because I cannot sleep well and I'm the one who can decide this. Only if we have people who have that kind of power, we have companies who can be responsible. If you have CEOs who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to do this, but I have to do this, otherwise I'm fired. We won't save our economy. We won't save our planet.
So to exit the system, you have to exit shareholder value to actually do what you really have to do. And we're trying to do what we really have to do. But it's, uh, it's hard. If you just follow the numbers, it's much easier actually, you know? Let's double. Next year we double. What do we do next year? Well, we double. Okay, cool. That, that, that's, it's crazy, but uh, that's how it works. If you say, you have to invent a way how we could all live together peacefully in the future and not fuck up our planet. Mm -hmm. That's really a hard task. That's much harder than doubling profits. We, like going to the US, we would easy double. And what I found is there are some other models. There are companies like Bosch, like Zeiss, who've set up a certain kind of ownership, which ensures that the company is owned in a new way. It's owned by stewards, by trustees, by people who say, well, yes, we are controlling the company, but we are just the stewards. It's not our wealth. But at some point, you, you kind of signed away the ownership. Yes, last year, 18th of December, we sat here in kind of a weird uh, yoga outfit because it was our Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And then the lawyers came and then we signed that um, it's not ours anymore. Wasn't that... Uh a hard decision to do? Yeah, it still is. Because it's the company is also worth something. So you basically you sign away the chance to Yes. To earn a couple of million euros. Yeah. Like yeah. or more, I don't know. Tens. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. You know you did the right thing, but uh, it feels weird. I like nice cars and I like, like nice things and I could have bought an apartment like this and put everything like I would uh, have wanted it and not pay rent anymore and, I don't know, do the normal thing. And now I can't. So I won't be able to do that anymore. And that's, I think that's what, but, the, um, but giving up on that changes you, of course, because you can't be like, you, you can't do it. And, um, and you know that it's also wrong to do it. It's not good to own so many things. It's not good for the world because if I own, can own, like just building a company for five years and then getting 10 million or 20 million out of it, that's just, that's not how like real value is created. It's not true. Um, and getting out of that, like be, doing the true thing, but having grown up in the 90s, is fucked up in, in the head, of course, because you always saw that it's cool to have a nice car. And now you just, you know it's wrong, but it's still nice. They still have these things, you know? Ah, it's, diff it's like a drug, maybe. Yeah, if we don't use this, you know, terrible crisis that we're still living through and that's causing so much human uh, misery and tragedy and deaths worldwide as an opportunity for change, we're just gonna be setting up, as we have in the past, the next crisis. If we don't use this as an opportunity for change, of investing in you know, global health systems, in the capacity of the public service to actually be able to manage a crisis, in steering our economy in a way that becomes less, deep, uh, less financialized, more sustainable, so companies are actually reinvesting their profits, but especially reinvesting those profits in areas that transform those companies that bring us on a, a growth path that's more inclusive and sustainable, we're just gonna go from crisis to crisis to crisis. You remember Milton Friedman, the economist who in the 70s wrote this article on why a CEO had to do all they could to maximize the shareholders' profits? And how everybody went with that? It's where it all started, remember? The consequence of that idea is that companies aim for the short term. And this worked well for almost half a century. Fast profits and whatever happens in the long run, we don't think about that. And you know what I came to think a couple of years ago? That all of this focus on the shareholder prevented us from thinking about the future. Just focus on the profits for the coming quarter, nothing else. And that far away future we were not thinking about, that future is now. I'm using the time to redecorate a bit, you know? That's actually the essence of a startup, you know? It's actually this a kicker table or table tennis. And that doubles the company value already for the shareholder. Because of the public image, of course. Otherwise, it's not new.